Okay, so look, I know what you're thinking from the video title, but just know that this is going to be a balanced and thoughtful argument and isn't just going to be me devoutly defending Harry Maguire for the entire thing. Actually, it might mostly just be that. Oh, Harry Maguire, how did we get here? Easily one of the most popular football players in the country during England's Euro 2020 run, but 10 months later, a chorus of boos at a packed Wembley Stadium greeted the mere mention of his name on an England team sheet. Now we've reached the end of the 21-22 season, the general consensus among football fans now is that Harry Maguire is quite easily the worst defender in the league, if not the worst defender in any football league anywhere in the world. That might seem like hyperbole, but just spend five minutes on any social media platform and that's really the only conclusion you can come to. Harry Maguire is apparently very, very bad at professional football and everyone is practically in unanimous agreement. Maguire has been publicly booed by fans of his own team and his own country this season. The hate for him has reached volcanic levels and the break in between seasons does not seem to have calmed any of the anger. I just saw some of Man United's match against Crystal Palace in a pre-season friendly in Melbourne where the reading of his name from the team sheet was once again booed by his own team's fans and he was booed for the first 10 minutes every time he touched the ball. There seems to be this ridiculous notion now that Harry Maguire has actually never put in a good performance for club or for country. This is not an accepted understanding that Maguire has had a bad season. There's an underlying perception that, well, he's always been bad. He's not only no longer good enough to play for Manchester United, but he was never good enough. Manchester United paid 80 million pounds for a fridge. 80 million. He's a fridge. But if we're to believe this, then there's really only two ways that he could have made it this far. So let's think about it. Number one, yes, Maguire is and has always been awful. He fooled the scouts at Hull into signing him from Sheffield United, where he was voted player of the year by both fans and the players. He then somehow tricked the scouts over at Leicester City into signing him, where they foolishly awarded him the Player of the Season award as well as the Players Player of the Season award after playing every single minute of the 2017-2018 campaign. He then again tricked the scouts at Man United into paying 80 million for him, even though all along he was always shit. Or he's an excellent player who's had one underperforming season in an absolutely crap United team where no one looked good. I don't have to tell you which I think is more likely. There is no set of people on earth with shorter memories than football fans. What people forget is that Harry Maguire signing for Manchester United was deemed as a success up until this season. In the season before Maguire's arrival, Man United finished in sixth place and had the 10th worst defensive record in the league. On his debut season for United, United finished in third with the third best defensive record in the league. A clear, obvious and immediate turnaround in their defence, in which Harry Maguire played every single minute of every single Premier League game that season. In his following season, their defensive record with him slipped slightly just to fifth best, which was still far better than United's season before him, but he still played over 3,000 Premier League minutes, now as United's captain, and his team finished in second place their best finish since the departure of Sir Alex Ferguson. If you look back at journalist and fan opinions from those times, no one is even questioning the price tag or his impact, or really even the decision to give him the captaincy. Most of the discussion back then was an agreed understanding that Maguire had made Manchester United a far better defensive unit, and the missing piece would be to find a new centre-back to play alongside him. There also seems to be this notion that, despite him being booed by England fans anyway, that Maguire does play better for the national team than he does for his club. And the undeniable and obvious reason that you will hear for this, from fans and some professional football writers alike, is that the only reason Maguire is good for England is because... England play in a back five with a low defensive line. I simply cannot believe the amount of times I've heard this. And as someone who watches England a lot, I just can't agree. And I don't see where this has come from. 
Look, let's just look at the facts. Between the 18th of November 2020 to the 29th of March 2022, the England national team went on a streak of 22 games unbeaten in regulation time. Out of those 22 games, England played in a back four for the majority of them, 15 times. Maguire started 13 of these 22 games and featured in a back four for eight of those 13 starts. And yes, I went back through and checked the lineup for every single one of those games because that's the level of dedication that you get here, apparently. And England back four with Maguire conceded a grand total of two goals from open play across those eight games. Although an England back five is, of course, totally not uncommon, the statistics prove that England and Maguire play the majority of their games in a back four. But OK, OK, I hear you. You don't care. Qualification games and friendlies don't count or whatever. So let's just look at the big games and at Euro 2020. If we look back at the last 10 fixtures before Euro 2020, on average, England played with the third highest defensive line amongst all these other top nations. Thanks to Mark R. Stats on Twitter for the graphic. At Euro 2020, England played seven games and played in a back four for five of those seven. Croatia, Scotland, Czech Republic, Ukraine and Denmark. In the big tournament, in the important games, England played mostly in a back four with a high line. With Maguire in the side for Czech Republic, Germany, Ukraine, Denmark and Italy, England conceded a grand total of zero goals from open play. The real reason Maguire looks better for England than he did for Manchester United last season is because England were structurally much better. You can say whatever you want about Gareth Southgate's ability to set up an attacking side, and that's probably a topic for another video, but it's undeniable that England are a defensively sound team where every player is confident in their role on the pitch. Out of that 22 unbeaten streak, England conceded a total of six goals. For comparison, Spain conceded 15, France conceded 15, and Germany conceded 20, all in the same time frame. Yes, I checked through all the games for all of those countries as well, leave me alone. Maguire defends better for his country than he does for his club because his country is set up and coached better. That's all there really is to it. Okay, I know we just lost 4-0 at home to Hungary, but for now, that result is an anomaly. And look, Maguire didn't even play in that game until it was already over. So give me a break. My point stands. On to my next point. Manchester United under Ralph Rangnick were one of the worst coached teams in the league last season. And I know this because Rafael Varane has about 15 Champions League winners medals. United brought him in and it didn't make any difference to their defence. I think there's this idea that Varane was injured for most of last season and therefore it doesn't really count, but Varane still made 22 Premier League appearances and featured for over 1,800 minutes, in which United conceded 22 goals while he was on the pitch and just 5 clean sheets. Now look, this isn't a Rafael Varane hit piece and I'm not trying to compare Maguire with Varane or, or anything like that. In fact, I'm trying to do the exact opposite. Did any of those Manchester United defenders look good last season under Rangnick? Luke Shaw also came off the back of a brilliant Euro 2020 to have a bad season. No one is raving about Lindelof. Varane has 45 Champions League winners medals and he didn't improve them. The less said about Dallo and, and Tellez, the better. And Aaron Wan-Bissaka no longer even looks like a professional footballer. So again, I go back to asking, what is the most likely scenario here? Did the entire Manchester United defence, a defence that finished second in the league the season before, all just forget how to play football overnight? Or should we all just take a step back and before we package up Maguire and fire him into the sun for his crimes, take a look at the bigger picture? So then, I guess that's it. Case closed. Is Harry Maguire an £80 million fridge? Well, yes, actually. Sort of, yeah. We can all see it, can't we? Maguire is clumsy and he's slow and he's not very agile and he can make awful mistakes and he struggles when exposed 1v1 against players with pace. But my point is, is that any defender at this level can look like a fridge or a donkey or washed up or finished, whatever term you want to tweet, when they aren't playing in a system or in a style that suits their strengths and hides their weaknesses. This is elite professional football, the top of the top. Defending starts from the front and is an entire team effort. Defending is not 
simply about blocking shots or winning headers. Although, yeah, of course you have to do those things. It's a structural concept with and without the ball, which involves the whole team. I genuinely think you could have switched any of those United centre-backs with Van Dijk or, I don't know, a 1994 version of Paolo Maldini, and it wouldn't have fixed all the issues that defence had last season. United's defence were left constantly exposed under Rangnick. Another season had gone by without United signing a defensive midfielder to screen in front of the back four. And the difference this season compared to the previous is that Rangnick failed to find a system to accommodate this. Again, you can say what you want about him and he's by no means perfect. But I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, to some degree, actually did understand this. Under Solskjaer, United sat a little deeper, protected their defence with numbers a bit more and hit teams with pacey wide players on the counter-attack. You know, it's not revolutionary stuff, of course, and I'm not trying to say Solskjaer is some sort of tactical genius that definitely would have won United 10 Champions League titles, but there was a clear understanding of how to get a performance out of its players. But I don't think you even have to sit deep and counter-attack to accommodate Maguire. As said before, England don't really do this. Under Rangnick, it's not like Man United were a possession-heavy team able to stop opposition attacks by just having most of the ball. And outside maybe 45 minutes against Crystal Palace in Van Nick's first game as manager, Man United weren't really a pressing team either, at least not an efficient one, and the entire shape and structure of the team looked constantly stretched and confused, and their defence, and in particular Harry Maguire, suffered from the exposure badly. Look, Jurgen Klopp has arguably the best central defender in world football in his team, and he still plays hard-working midfielders like Fabinho and Henderson in front of Van Dijk to lessen the frequency in which he is exposed 1v1. They also press efficiently as a team, preventing the opposition from getting their heads up and playing decisive passes over their back line. Pep's Man City has about 90% possession every game, and when they lose the ball, it's Rodri's job to sweep in front of Dias and Stones, and when he can't do that, it's his job to make the foul to stop play so they don't get exposed 1v1. United could not find a plan or a system to prevent this happening last season, and here's a good example of that in the first goal Liverpool scored against them in the most recent 4-0 defeat. Let's pause the frame here and look at the situation. Matic has been drawn all the way over to the ball on the left-hand side here like a moth to a light bulb. Pogba has absolutely no interest in shuffling over and dealing with Mane, who has just walked into the space between United's midfield and defence. I mean, just look how much space he has here. I feel like any central defender, and not just Maguire specifically, is a bit dead here no matter what they do. If he closes down Mane early, then he's at risk of Mane spinning off him and going into the huge space in behind. Dallo isn't there to cover him as he's pushed forward on the left. If he backs off Mane, then Mane has all the space in the world to control, turn and run at him as Pogba is just nowhere near. It's an awful situation that any central defender would struggle in. The ball is fed into Mane in acres of space. Maguire has to close him down to prevent him turning as neither midfielder in front of him are in a position to do so and the ball is fed into Salah who then links with Diaz to do the rest. Could Maguire have done better here? Yeah, of course. Maybe he could have held his line and took the gamble on Mane being able to turn and run, or maybe he should have gone in harder and earlier and prevented Mane from scooping the ball around the corner. Look, I'm not trying to say Maguire is this perfect defender who is never at fault, and I'll talk more about that later. But what I am saying is that when a player like Sadio Mane is allowed that much time and space in front of your defence, then that's because there has been a systemic breakdown in the entire team's game plan and isn't just a personnel issue that would be instantly fixed if Varane was here instead of Maguire. Maguire has actually done this a lot this season. He often has to leap out from his defensive line to close an unmarked player down in midfield. I'm unsure if this is something he is deciding to do in the moment or if he was being asked to do it by the manager. Here's another example. This time McAllister walked into the space between United's defence and midfield. Fred has to deal with Gross and McTominay is ball watching. The ball is played into him. Maguire once again has to step up and close him down to prevent him turning, which in turn leaves a massive gap in behind and no wait, hold on a minute, that's fucking Lindelof! 
The failure of United to prevent these situations plagued their entire season, and none of their central defensive pairings could handle it. Ironically, the Maguire haters actually got what they wanted for this game, as Maguire was dropped and Randnick started Lindelof and Varane. They then proceeded to get pumped 4-0 by Brighton anyway. Almost every single Man United player struggled this season, playing for a broken and messy team. I think, or at least I hope, there is a large subsection of footballing fans who do actually understand this and who do get that Maguire alone was not the only issue. So why is it that he got most of the abuse? Well, to put it simply, uh, Maguire is just quite an easy target to take the piss out of. In a way, I guess we should have seen this coming, and it's probably something of a minor miracle that he ever became as popular as he once was. As the song goes, he has a big head, and his face, uh, let's just say he doesn't have the conventional Premier League footballer face. He's got a bit of that Bill Jones about him where, through no fault of his own, obviously, the cameras can catch him pulling some highly memeable expressions. He's big and he doesn't look particularly graceful on the pitch, and, well, he plays for Man United a team whose demise rival fans are revelling in following their utter dominance throughout the 90s and early 2000s in English football. The massive price tag United paid for him is the last cherry on top of the shit cake. I mean, he's also English, which is the biggest sin any man could ever commit if you spend too much time listening to Twitter. And maybe there is something to that. It feels like you can't go 10 seconds on social media without seeing a tweet or a reply on Instagram about how awful Harry Maguire is. Most of the time, the post in question has nothing to do with United or Maguire in the first place, and yet the comment section will be full of people mentioning his name. The jokes and the memes are the easiest low-hanging fruit that the perpetually online football fan is continuing to lap up. I mean, come on, how long have we been doing this? It's been a full year now, and it's not really showing any signs of slowing down. Every player gets abuse and banter in the cesspit, which is football Twitter, I'm not trying to sit here and say that grown men who are paid hundreds of thousands of pounds per week are devoid of criticism or shouldn't be able to take a joke. To a certain extent, all of this is all a game, isn't it? And it's all a bit of fun that is very much part of being a football fan. But I think where we are this time and to this extent and to this level, it has trickled down and seeped into the subculture of match-going fans. Twitter isn't real and is not an accurate representation of the wider public's opinion, just ask Jeremy Corbyn, but the level of disdain and hatred for the scapegoat that is Harry Maguire has reached such a level that I think it's become impossible for anyone to ignore, whether you're an avid Twitter teenager or not. He even gets it from ex-professionals who should simply know better. Van der Vaart's comments where he claimed that amateur Sunday league defenders are better than him is just a ridiculous thing to say on live television. But I'm convinced that he doesn't actually believe it himself. It's just an easy point score, which is what most of this is. Harry Maguire equals bad, click that retweet button. It's just weird and pretty shameful that an ex-professional player who definitely knows the highs and lows that come with being in the game and definitely went through some spells of being in and out of form himself would sink to that level too. Look, I'm sure the vast majority of England and Man United fans do not hate Maguire and would not boo him when in a stadium, but all it takes is a subsection of them to get caught up with the teenage keyboard warriors for it to make a real difference when it counts. And worse, it can start to have real world ramifications off the pitch. It's one thing to log onto Twitter and tweet about how Penaldo is finished, it's another to be so ridiculously whipped into a frenzy by the online discourse that you phone in a bomb threat on someone's house. And you know, I've seen people argue in a way that Maguire deserves a lot of the stick that he's been getting. There's an argument to suggest that he's brought this upon himself by not accepting responsibility for his team's performances. But look, I, I don't know, what does that even mean? What does taking responsibility even mean? Does it mean kicking off on the pitch and throwing your arms up at your teammates every five minutes and then immediately trying to leave the club as soon as they don't achieve Champions League football? Maguire does seem to genuinely care about the club and play for the badge. If you remember back a little while ago, Xhaka was relentlessly booed by Arsenal fans and when he got subbed off in that game, he threw down the armband and he flipped off the fans, which was probably justified. It would be easy for Maguire to have lost his head and done something similar with the treatment he's been getting, but he's been pretty respectful to everyone involved in the club. 
To paraphrase, he made a comment in an interview about how he must be doing something right because he always keeps getting picked and it didn't go down very well. It fostered a perception that Maguire is arrogant and full of himself and the, the fingers in the ears celebration that he did against Albania fueled it even further. But I mean honestly, doesn't he have somewhat of a point? All the managers do keep picking him. Mourinho has gone on record to say that he wanted to sign him. Solskjaer started him every game. Randnick picked him for every game. Southgate picked him as soon as he was ready to play for Euro 2020. Like, he has a point. And don't start this nonsense I keep seeing about him only getting picked because he's English and Man United are an English club or whatever. Why would a German manager of a club that is owned by Americans give a damn that Maguire is English? Rannick hooked Ronaldo at several points last season. Ronaldo. If Rannick didn't want Maguire on the pitch, he wouldn't be on the pitch. In fact, dropping him would probably be the easy thing to do considering everyone hated him and he was being booed in his own stadium. And then they did drop him for the Brighton game and they got slapped 4-0, so whatever. He's the captain of one of the biggest clubs in the world. Isn't it a good thing that he's got a bit about him when faced with adversity and he's tried to remain confident in himself and in his abilities? Would it really help him or the team in any way if he came out in some interviews and was like, oh, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm bad. I'm a bad football. I did bad. Oh, I'm so, please, please forgive me. No player wants their captain to react like that. And even if he did do something like that to appease the fans, Manchester United wouldn't start suddenly winning football matches. As already covered, the real issues here are much bigger than what Harry Maguire says post-match and who wears an elastic band with the letter C on it on their bicep. And come on, you've got to be a bit arrogant as a professional footballer in that high-pressure environment, don't you? You don't make it unless you are a bit. I thought the fingers in the ears celebration against Albania was fantastic and just wound everyone up for no reason. If I was him, I'd do it again against San Marino or something just to see everyone's heads roll off once more. In all seriousness, what I need to emphasise here, and I'm not sure if this has gotten across fully, so I'll state it now, is that I don't think Maguire is the perfect central defender who can do no wrong. I don't think he's the best defender in the world, and if money wasn't a factor, I think there are players out there who could perform better than Maguire in this Manchester United side, of course. I accept that he has way, way underperformed this season, but he's underperformed alongside an entire squad that has underperformed due to a totally disastrous mismatch in coaching. But I think that's exactly what this is, a one season underperformance. It seems like everyone has taken the end result and then worked their way backwards until we've reached this revisionist history where Maguire has never ever been good and has somehow conned his way into a top level professional career, which is just ridiculous. Harry Maguire makes mistakes, sometimes absolutely awful and unexplainable ones. The weird backhill clearance in the game against City springs to mind, but his ball progression and his ball carrying into midfield is elite and a serious weapon. He's a monster in the air and he's aggressive and he's dominant in the box. Put him into a system where he's not constantly dragged out into midfield or exposed 1v1 in wide positions and we've seen clear evidence of the type of brilliant performances he can put in. Look, I am so happy to be wrong. I've been wrong before, I'll be wrong again, I'll be wrong forever. I'm going out on a massive limb in this video and there's every chance Ten Hag drops him and he no longer gets into the United side and maybe he falls out of favour with England and I'm left with egg on my face but I just don't see it and I'm confident enough to say that he'll be back and he'll prove many of the doubters wrong next season if United can get their act together. United have signed Alessandro Martinez which I originally thought might be a sign of this happening but if pre-season is anything to go by, it seems like Ten Hag likes Maguire. He shifted Maguire to right centre-back and Lissandro is going to slot in in that left centre-back slot. And he's kept Harry as captain. At the end of the day, I know Big John 666561 on Twitter might not rate him, but every big name in professional football does. Maguire is an excellent top-class player. He's an excellent player. National team too. He had an incredible World Cup. He's strong in the air, good with the ball, the build-up, he drives with the ball, he's fast, so fast. He has all the qualities. 
And if you disagree with those words, well, then you aren't even disagreeing with me this time. Thanks for watching. Oh, that, that Maguire again. Get him out. Get, get him out. He, he is useless. He, he is ruining this. He is. Get him out. Oi, what I'm telling you. Look, I'm telling you. We need Pau Torres. Pau Torres in this club. What, what was that? How many times have I watched La Liga this season? Oh, well, you know. You know, I didn't. Honestly, mate, he was awful. He was so bad. He was. Did I watch the game? Oh. Not well. I actually, I actually missed this one. But but norm normally, you know, I mean, I, I was on Twitter. It was it was in the background while I was on. I saw enough. I sort of saw it. I sort of. If Ronaldo was the captain, I swear to you, we would not have lost a single game. Last his standards, he takes responsibility. What was that? He's off. He's leaving. He wants to leave. Maguire out. Maguire out. We hate Maguire. We hate Maguire. Maguire. <laughs> oh. I'm screwed if he has another bad season. I'm I'm finished.